Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real privilege uh, to come here to All Saints Leelam uh, and to bring God's word and worship together with you. Uh, now, as, uh, as Richard mentioned, uh, we're going through this uh, pulpit swap series uh, on generations. Uh, and the title we came up with is Talking About My Generations. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the song by The Who. I thought it was called The Who's, but that shows what generation I'm in. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't as aware of the song. I kind of heard of it, uh, but didn't know of it as much. Uh, now, uh, I was going to ask the question, who among you were born between 1997 to 2012? <laughs> now, <laughs> who may be between 12 to 27? Now, you can think, uh, am I that age in heart, perhaps, or in spirit? <laughs> but you can think about perhaps your grandchildren. Uh, your great-grandchildren, if you have them, or others you know around you who fit that age category. Uh, and they'll be referred to as Gen Zs. Now, that sounds very American, uh, but that's how it's kind of referred to a lot of the time. So Generation Z or Gen Zs. Uh, and I want to kind of introduce uh, Gen Zs to you. Um, and I hope that as you think about it, you'll be able to think about uh, those who are younger, the younger generations, uh, a lot of whom I work together with uh, in Wynn, as I mentioned, uh, with Elspeth uh, and Johnny, uh, and think about the challenges that they might face uh, and the ultimate pressing need that they have. Uh, but let me introduce them a little bit to you. Uh, so uh, in the next slide, uh, ah, yes, so you can kind of see uh, the different generations. Uh, so some of you may be part of the boomer generation or silent generation, uh, I think Andy is Generation X. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I am Generation Y, or referred to as Millennials. Uh, and yeah, Keith, uh, who's coming to preach here next week, uh, he's preaching on the Boomer Generation. Uh, he's also part of the Boomer Generation. Uh, and those who were born before the war, uh, during or before Second World War, are referred to as the Silent Generation. Uh, and so I'm preaching on the last generation, and I want to kind of show you some of the changes that's occurred around in the generations, in the times, uh, and think about, okay, how can we help them uh, in their spiritual growth, in their maturity, uh, in their walk with Jesus? Uh, so in the next slide, uh, you'll see this picture. Uh, and you probably remember uh, licking a poster stamp. Uh, when perhaps maybe the last time, because I was thinking about, I remember licking a poster stamp, uh, but it's been a really long time. Uh, the way that people are communicating has changed, isn't it? I only found out recently that last year, the old poster stamps that I have in my wallet is obsolete now. I can't use them because it doesn't have the barcode. So that came in last year, I think. But if you, next time you see someone who's between the age of 12 to 27, ask them whether they have ever licked a poster stamp. You might have, I asked this to some of the kids in Ashford. The older ones, I think they had, a, they had some experience. <laughs> One of them actually told me their parents got them to lick it just to experience it. <laughs> but some of the younger ones, they were, when I asked this question, they were looking at me with a strange look and thinking, why would people do this? <laughs> why would people lick postage stamps? What weird hobbies people had in the past. <laughs> uh, but you can see how the way in which we communicate has changed. They are a lot more familiar with texts, emails, Snapchat, whatever that is. <laughs> the way that people have communicated has changed over the times. Also, uh, in the next slide, uh, you see this kind of statement, uh, let me Google it for you. <laughs> now, you probably remember a time uh, when that phrase started to be used a bit more often. Uh, so that was around 2002, 2006, when people started to use Google as a verb. <laughs> It was put into the dictionary, Merriam-Webster dictionary, uh, in 2006. Uh, but the Zen Zs, they were always used to that idea of, let's Google it. Let's ask Google. And so that the way that they access information is very different. You may have gone to the library. I remember, actually, uh, flicking through uh, the is it, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> yeah. Where are they nowadays? There's versions of it online. But now, the way you access information is to Google it. I also, you can also ask them when you see them, uh, this question, uh, next slide, um, whether they know what a floppy disk is. <laughs> now, oh, let me ask you, let me ask you, you might remember. Do you remember the storage capacity of floppy, floppy disks? 
1.44, nice, right in there. Yeah. Uh, even some millennials didn't know, <laughs> I'm going to say. Uh, I remember using floppy disk, and I explained to the Zenzies, 1.44 megabytes is about half a song. So, but they access uh, content and all these kind of media through Spotify, where they can access music straight away, uh, through YouTube, where you can just see videos uh, really quickly and upload them as well, Netflix, see films. Remember, we had to go to the cinema. Downloading a film took ages. But now you can just stream it online. Life is much more online, isn't it? Uh, and so for Gen Zs, uh, through the recent technology changes, through computers, the internet, social media, and smartphones, uh, it's changed our world drastically. And Gen Zs has grown up as natives in such a world. Whereas in some sense, we are immigrants to such a world. I remember a time before the internet myself as well. Uh, but Gen Zs have grown up as digital natives in a, in a strong sense. Millennials and Gen Zs. Uh, they are also uh, the most diverse racially and ethnically. And they were taught when they were younger to value diversity in schools. But as I want to kind of state uh, from, this, um, from this message today, uh, they are the most distracted and divided in their attention, and they're also sadly depressed and pessimistic in their mentality. Uh, so those are some of the things that I want to look with you. <laughs> By the way, so in that uh, image it says, uh, a kid saw this and said, oh, you 3D printed the save icon, <laughs> which I thought was quite funny. Uh, but anyway, we want to look with you, I want to look with you uh, to Jesus' um, illustration, image uh, of the house which was possessed by a spirit, an evil spirit, it leaves it, but then becomes even more possessed as it brings in seven more spirits more evil than itself. So in the next slide, uh, you'll see some of the points that it comes with. So I want to think with you, um, how should we understand this generation spiritually? What are the challenges that they face and what is their pressing need? Uh, looking at Jesus' illustration of the spirit-possessed man, a spirit-possessed house, I want us to think about Generation Z, Gen Zs, your grandchildren, uh, and so on. Jesus uses this illustration uh, ultimately to warn against neutrality, against kind of setting on the fence, as it were. Choose him or just kind of uh, turn the other way. Uh, even if an evil spirit, he says, comes out of a man, unless Jesus occupies the man, the, spirit, the evil spirit will return with seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And we read in the illustration uh, that the final condition of the man will be worse than the first. And I want to show you how something like this has happened over the past generations when we emptied the house of our old powers and authorities, instead pursuing freedom and individualism since the boomer generation, since after the Second World War. And we are seeing more and more the negative fruits of that experiment, especially among Senzis. And I hope that one of the outcomes of this sermon that I have in mind, that I hope will come about, uh, is that, so I have a temptation sometimes to think, ah, oh, these young people, <laughs> kind of like society is changing so much, and these young people, they are to blame. <laughs> no, I, there is that temptation to look to young people with disdain. I feel that at times as well. But I hope that this, this message will help us uh, to not see them with disdain, but rather to see them with compassion, with love. To have a, perhaps a bit, of, a bit more of an understanding of where they may be coming from. What is the circumstances in which they're growing uh, to promote good understanding between the generations? So my first point, uh, the emptied house. Uh, when an evil spirit, this is in verse 24 and 25, when an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. So Jesus gave this illustration in a conversation that arose after he had exorcised a man possessed by a demon that was mute. The man spoke and the crowd were amazed, verse 14. Through such power to rescue people from evil spirits, Jesus demonstrated that the kingdom of God had come through him. 
Kingdom not in terms of static territory, but in terms of dynamic reign. The reign of God had come through him. The reign of evil was ending, and the reign of God was coming. But imagine, imagine you were there, and imagine if the man, freed of the demon, didn't accept the reign of God through Christ. He had the demon kind of left, uh, leave him, be exorcised, and he says, thank you to Jesus, but he says, no thanks to having God reign my life, be king over my life. Such a man would be like the emptied house, swept clean and put in order, but not for long. Such a scenario can be used to understand what our culture and society has been trying to do since World War II through something called individualism. Uh, and that's something really big that's, got, that's occurred over the last decades. It's been trying to free itself from the oppressive chains of traditional authority and rules and aggressively pursuing the values of individual freedom and expression. That's one way of understanding the massive changes that's happened over the last couple of generations. Whereas before there was a respect for authority and rules, now there is much more of a pursuit for individual freedom and expression. Uh, Jean Twenge, uh, who's, um, who's a uh, professor, sorry, uh, who is a professor of psychology uh, at San Diego State University, uh, I think Johnny has or will refer to this person as well, uh, she writes, uh, every generation born since World War II has embraced its own flavor of individualism. For boomers, I think Keith next week, uh, it was rebelling against the restrictive social rules of the post-war era, especially those around sex and marriage. Uh, for Gen Xers, think Andy, uh, pione Gen Xers pioneered brash self-confidence in the 1980s. Think about the music in the 80s and the shoulder pads, <laughs> believing they were above average and taking it for granted that they should put themselves first. That was going on in the 80s. Uh, and for millennials like myself, the individualism of the 1990s and 2000s continued the trend Gen X has started and gave it an extra twist. And this is going on in the minds of some uh, millennials. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks of you, it whispers into the ears of millennials, as long as you believe in yourself. Can you see the effect of individualism going across throughout the generations? And she goes on to write, Gen Z, Gen Z, accepts what's gone before and raises the individualistic bar. People should be able, for example, they believe, to decide which gender group they identify with, or even reject the notion of gender binary entirely. Can you see the effect of individualism that started from the boomers, continued on with Gen Xers, millennials, and you can see how it's heightened in Zen Zs. So the way that you define yourself, your sexuality, your gender, your identity, how you view the world is determined more by yourself rather than external truths. This rejection of outside authority and tradition has turned us away from external absolute truths independent of us out there in the world to focus more on internal truths in here within us. Rather than absolute and obje objective truth, it's my truth or your truth that people are more concerned with nowadays. Can you see how the house has been swept clean of the traditional authorities and rules of the past? Now, not all of them were good. <laughs> some of them did need some sweeping. But the modern self has been proudly thinking that has been now put in order through individualism. But what happens to an empty house if it is not occupied by someone? Uh, my second point, the crowded house. Uh, I've actually uh, recently moved out of a house uh, and it's empty right now. Uh, the new owners will move in sometime. Uh, but what would happen if no one moved in? What do you think? Mm, yeah. I'm sure, I, so actually the, the house that I moved into, that well, the house that I moved out of when I moved into that because people didn't live there for a while I saw a lot of spiders <laughs> when I was clearing it up and I'm sure if the house is left empty for even longer maybe over time uh, other animals might come in maybe some foxes I know that they're around where I lived maybe even squatters might move in 
and the garden overgrows, the house isn't cleaned, and the house's condition gets worse and worse, wouldn't it? In Jesus' illustration, uh, it says, uh, then the spirit, the evil spirit, goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the final condition of that man is worse than the first. In Gen Z's, we're seeing something of the unintended consequences of trying to empty the house of traditional authorities and rules and having only the individual as the arbiter of truth and value. And this is happening in a time when through technology, there are so many things vying for our attention and having an impact on our mentality. And we are too weak to keep the house clean ourselves. Rather than the utopia hoped for through individualism, the experience of life with NZs can feel more like a chaotic dystopia. Like a man with seven additional more wicked spirits entering into him, ideas, values, and contents are bombarding us, vying for our attention, impacting our mentality and the mentality of our children. In an age when we are bombarded with ideas, values, and contents, our attention is distracted and divided. Now, think about it for Zenzis, but also think about it for yourself. Uh, how, think about the question, uh, how many adverts do you think we see per day? <laughs> so, and it probably changed a lot over the time, didn't it? So I found out, uh, now, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure how reliable these data are. I googled it. Uh, but apparently in the 70s, uh, it was about 500 uh, to 1,600 per day. Think about the billboards, newspapers, uh, all sorts of things where there's branding, perhaps. Uh, in 2014, more recently, it went up to 5,000 per day. Social media uh, and just kind of like the bombardment of inf uh, kind of uh, the internet. Uh, Last year, 2023, apparently it was 6,000 to 10,000 adverts per day. Now, we do only register about, uh, about 100 ads per day. Um, but we can feel our attention being pulled here and there, can't you? Uh, just go out. You, you'll see a bus pass and there's an advert there. <laughs> uh, in some sense, when you see a car pass, the car's branding is some sort of advertisement. This, this is the advertisement. <laughs> Being always connected, our attentions are distracted and divided. And our attention spans are getting shorter. But what does this do to us spiritually and for the spiritual uh, health of the younger generations? Having our attention, attention distracted and divided, we have less time perhaps to reflect, to meditate, to give our attention, our devotion to God. Do you perhaps feel the urge Probably not amongst you. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, it may be. I was going to ask the question, do you feel the urge to get your smartphones out <laughs> uh, and check the news or your social media or the football scores? That may be the case for some of the younger generations, uh, for millennials, for Gen Zs. Because I know I do sometimes when I'm in a service. The constant bombardment of things vying for our attention is a real challenge to spiritual growth and coming to having cultivating a relationship with God and a concern for eternity. So Gen Zs are often distracted and divided in their attention, but also, sadly, more prone to be depressed and pessimistic in their mentality. Now, this isn't the case for all Gen Zs, but this is the average that we read of in research. Uh, Twenge, that I referred to before, uh, she writes, every indicator of mental health and psychological well-being has become more negative among teens and younger adults since 2012. Uh, in studies done, the percentage of teenagers who reported feelings connected with depression skyrocketed uh, from 2012. Uh, reporting, uh, uh, identifying with phrases like often feeling left out, often feeling lonely, not satisfied with themselves or life as a whole, feeling that they, ca that they can't do anything right and not enjoying life and feeling that their life is not useful. In 2021, nearly 30%, this is in America, but nonetheless, 30% of teenage girls and 12% of teenage boys suffered from clinical level depression. Well, that's kind of for two weeks not being able to, not having the motivation to do anything. And uh, not just NZs, 
Uh, and it's not just that Gen Zs are more open to talk about these things, but there's rise in uh, depressive behavior as well, such as self-harm and suicide. So you can see that this is something really going on. Uh, Twingy says that uh, a key reason for this is the wide adoption of smartphones and social media around 2012, growing up in a time when they're co constantly comparing themselves to others and bombarded with negative news. And sadly, increasing screen use sometimes of often means less sleep for them as well, which adds to worse mental health. And so, sadly, uh, this increase in depression has increased to pessimism about the world among Zen Zs. And feeling out of control, uh, reporting that they feel that they can't control anything in their life. Now, this might be painting somewhat of a negative uh, picture of Zen Zs. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that there are a lot of positives about Zen Zs. Uh, with the fact that they're digital natives, they're very resourceful and innovative and creative. But spiritually speaking, there are these areas of concern, these challenges that they face, where they're distracted and divided in their attention, and depressed and pessimistic in their mentality as a generation. And it's not only true for Zen Zs, but maybe others as well. Millennials, Gen Xers, baby boomers, maybe even some of you. As the generations pass, seven more wicked spirits have gone into the house of the modern self and lived there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. Now, if what I've said so far are the challenges Gen Z faces, what is their pressing need? How can the crowded house become a blessed house, as my final verse suggests. Now, you can imagine all this talk of demon possession was making things a bit awkward in talks with Jesus, uh, Beelzebub and all these kind of things. Uh, that might be why a woman in the crowd in verse 27, look with me with a passage uh, together. Uh, as, the Je as Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. He replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. To, to not sit on the fence of neutrality, but to commit to following him. Those who hear the word of God and obey it are the equivalent of those who have their house occupied by one stronger than Satan who previously occupied the house. Jesus uses the illustration in verse 21 and 22. And this is what Jesus is talking, calling people to do to be freed from Satan's power and to not remain neutral, but to receive him as the Lord of the house by hearing the word of God and obeying it. This is what we all, in all generations, need to do. But especially Zen Zs, as they seek to navigate such a distracted and divided world, vying for their attentions, impacting their mentality to be depressed and pessimistic. Jesus truly is the cure and the master that they need, that you need, in our lives. The modern self has been trying its best to make itself the master of the house. After throwing away the spirit of traditional authority and values, but the house is being wrecked by the spirits of the present age, isn't it? And only Jesus is strong enough to restore the house and put it in order. Only Jesus can satisfy the inner longings of our hearts, of the Zen Z's hearts, that causes them to scroll endlessly through their phones, but never feeling satisfied. Only Jesus can give them clear guidance and hope in the midst of an ever more distracted and divided, depressed and pessimistic generation. Only Jesus can give them true freedom to be who they were made to be, children of God rather than having the constant pressure to invent themselves or find themselves according to this world. We need to give to Jesus our attention. That's what Zen Zs need to do. And we need to model that well for them, don't we? To give our attention to Jesus. That they may be less tempted to give their attention to social media or Netflix or YouTube, but to give their attention ultimately to Jesus. Now, one of the takeaways that I don't want you to have in some sense uh, is to go to Gen Z's and say, ah, oh, you kids with your smartphones, you should look at it less. 
I don't want you to feel the pressure, uh, temptation to say that to them when you see them. Uh, but it does help. Uh, I have read that maybe 30 minutes to an hour of smartphone uh, or social media use is helpful for teenage, ment uh, teenage mental health. Uh, but it's ultimately about giving our attention to something else, to something healthier, to something, to someone like Jesus. That's what helps our spiritual health as well. And for the Gen Zs, to give their attention to Jesus, giving him access to all of the rooms of their house, as it were, is a thing that they and us need to do. Not just a part of our house, by the way. I think some of us attempted to just give to Jesus uh, the foyer of the house, uh, the entrance of the house, maybe even to the living room and to the dining room, but not our bedrooms or our wallets or our, or our cupboards, not our phones, what we look around on it. But we are to have Jesus as the master of all areas of our life, not to compartmentalize our attention and our devotion to Jesus. And as I close this message, I want us to remember Mary Magdalene, from whom actually seven demons did come out. Imagine, perhaps like a Gen Z, how chaotic and hopeless her life would have been before, uh, before she met Jesus. But she found her rest in Jesus and gave him her attention, her devotion, her life. That's what I think Zen Zs can be when they, become, when they become a Christian themselves. They're in some sense far more keen to have an authentic relationship with Jesus rather than just superficial religiosity. They're far more keen, uh, far more able to reach out to people uh, with ever-changing technologies and to tell people of Jesus. I'm amazed by some of the things that uh, the kids in Wind do with their videos and, and acting and so on. And when they also come to believe in a cause, they're far more committed at times and take action to follow Jesus as well. Wouldn't it be amazing to see these Gen Zs distracted and divided in their, in their attention, though they may be, be, may be, and depressed and pessimistic in their mentality, though they may be, when they come to know Jesus? What a drastic change that will bring in their lives. With that in mind, may we model and follow Jesus and give him all of the room in our house ourselves, that they may see what Christ means to us, that they may come to follow Christ themselves as well. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, Lord, as we think about how, how, such, how the times have changed, Lord, um, the generations have changed so much, but we thank you that Jesus is unchanging, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And regardless of how old we are, what generation we belong to, we can trust in him. And he is the cure. He is the one uh, who, who is the master of the house, who cleans us of all our sins, of all our anxieties and worries, that we can cast it before him. And he sorts us out, as it were. And though, Lord, living in this world, we, our lives can still be a great mess. We thank you that the Holy Spirit works in us to make us more like Jesus. And we can look forward to that day when he will return in glory and we'll be together with him in the new heaven and the new earth and there'll be no more sin, no more tears and we will glory in him. Lord, we look forward to this and we pray, Lord, that your work in the younger generations, especially the Zen Zs, living with the challenges that they face, Lord, help them to know Jesus. Help them to know him working in all areas of their lives, their identity, their sexuality, uh, the way that they see the world, that they wouldn't be focused on themselves, but they would give their attention to Jesus and have their lives transformed through him. So help us, Lord, to model that well for them. Help us, Lord, that they may hear your words and obey it and become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.